So the book I wrote was, is called Beyond the Golden Gate, it's a maritime history of California. And I'll speak a little bit today about the process by which this uh, book came to fruition, kind of the, the genesis of the, the project, and uh, how it began, and, and why I felt it was an important contribution to the field of maritime history, and then some of the, uh, if, if I may say, some of the highlights of the book. Um, so I hope to just kind of give you a brief overview and then answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Oh, too far? Okay. So the project. It took me about three years to write this book, to research, uh, and to revise it so that it would be eligible for publication. Various parts of the book, different chapters, had appeared as articles in various scholarly publications. So it had been peer-reviewed, it had been kind of vetted through the historical community, and uh, it's received some pretty uh, uh, positive reviews. Uh, it's the result, really, of serendipity. I'm not a maritime historian by training. My PhD is in American ethnic history, immigration and ethnicity. Uh, I took my PhD from the City University of New York, where some of my colleagues in the room have also earned their doctorates. And uh, I was teaching and doing a lot of research in Irish America. And then I moved to California because my wife had a job out there. And I pulled up stakes and followed her. And I was teaching some courses in American history, just the general surveys, at Cal Maritime and a couple of other different campuses. And at Cal Maritime, they had a course in American maritime history. And the professor who taught it fell ill on really short notice. And they asked if somebody could take the course. And my wife was pregnant at the time, and we needed the money, and I said, sure, I could teach it. And they said, what makes you think you could teach a course in maritime history when your background is in Irish America? And I said, how did the Irish get to America? And they said, by vote. And I said, I'm your man. <laughs> and, and they fell for it. Really. And I just stayed one chapter ahead of the students, which is a trick that a lot of professors utilize. I'm looking at you, Chris. And, um, <laughs> so I stayed one chapter ahead of the, of the students. But it became pretty clear that the professor who had developed that course wouldn't be returning to the classroom. He was going to retire to deal with his health issues. So they asked if I would be interested in becoming, quote unquote, the maritime historian. And I was you know, really conflicted about this because I had done some good high level scholarship in Irish American history. My advisor had me ticketed for a professorship at Boston College. And this was something that I really didn't want to give up. But I also recognized that there were a lot of folks who did immigration, a lot of folks who did ethnicity, and hardly anyone who did maritime history. And I knew that I could be a big fish in a small pond, pardon the pun. So I kind of I decided to switch my, my train of, uh, of thought and go from a, a historian of immigration to a maritime historian. So I came to maritime history kind of circuitously and, and through uh, a rather unusual um, path. But I don't think that's uncommon for a lot of maritime historians. Not many people set out to be a PhD in maritime history. Most people get to maritime history through these kind of alternative methods. And it's because maritime history, I think, is one of the most um, alluring fields. Because by studying the sea and man's relationship to it, you have exposure to things like economic history, you have exposure to immigration, you have exposure to uh, maritime, um, uh, pardon me, military history, you have exposure to diplomatic history, you have exposure to environmental history. It touches on all of these different subfields. So it provides access and entree into a wide range of uh, areas of historical inquiry. And it just so happened that as I was becoming sort of uh, established as a maritime historian, the National Park Service um, put out a call for a historic resource study. So every national historical park has what's called a historical resource study, which tells the story of that particular park. Now, most national historical parks are associated with an event, Gettysburg, or a person, John Muir. San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park isn't associated with an event or a person, it's associated with a theme. And the theme is the role that San Francisco plays in America's maritime history. So they put out a call for uh, authors. It was a competitive grant process funded by the Organization of American Historians and the National Park Service. And I applied for it, and out of all the applicants, I was chosen to write this historic resources study. 
Um, and, and so that's how the book came, came to be. Okay, so the aim, what did I try to do by writing uh, Beyond the Golden Gate? It's a primer on California maritime history. No book existed that talked about the role of the sea in California's history. So there was a gap in the literature, a lack of it, as we say, right? So there was a, a need for someone to tell this story. And what you had was little articles or little uh, monographs that spoke about whaling, or that spoke about immigration, or that spoke about transportation. But there was none that had this overarching look at the role of the sea in maritime in, in California's history. So I decided to pull all these different disparate strands together and weave them together into a, a narrative. So the work is largely derivative, right? I'm building on scholarship that other historians have done, but it's also original research. I spent a lot of time in archives, a lot of time pouring through manuscripts, a lot of time looking at uh, photographic and archival evidence, and uh, looking at records from the 19th century is extraordinarily difficult because it's all handwritten. Um, there's no typewriting, there's no word processing. So you're looking at journals and you're trying to make heads or tails out of someone's illegible scrawl and um, most of these people are largely illiterate, they're not formally educated. So you're, there's a lot of room for interpretation, a lot of room for making mistakes. And what I tried to do was come up with this narrative story about the role of the ocean and, and rivers and waterways in California's history. And this was difficult because historians are taught to use the particular to illustrate the general, to extrapolate from a specific circumstance and make some grand conclusions. And what you're doing here is you're looking at the big picture, the oceans, and trying to interpolate and say, how does it relate to various other topics within California's history? So I was kind of, not only was I learning a new field, but I was learning a new way of doing history. So it was a very uh, difficult, iterative process. And really what I hoped was that the book, upon publication, would serve as a, a stimulus, that folks would read it and say, gee, I'd really like to learn more about uh, the whale fishery in San Francisco. Or I'd really like to learn more about uh, the role of uh, women in California. And they would use this as a touchstone for further scholarship. And I'm happy to say that that has actually happened already. So, if you look at the book, there are 12 chapters, and they focus on big issues, things like the geography of California, how Native Americans used and interacted with the waterways, uh, Spain, which was the first European power in California, and some of her challengers, like the Russians, the French, the, the, the Americans. Um, the gold rush is a maritime phenomenon. Most people, I think, think of the settling of California, and they think of wagon trains going across the plains, and they think of uh, boom towns, but it's very much a maritime phenomenon, as you'll see. We spoke about different commodities that are traded, grain, wheat, lumber, fish, sugar. You have all of these people who move into California. They need to be fed, they need to be housed, they need to be transported. All of that is done through maritime means. We speak about transportation, like ferry systems, um, uh, uh, steamboats on, on the western rivers. You look at trans-Pacific um, uh, immigration patterns, mostly done in China. And then we deal with labor issues and shipbuilding. So California is the hotbed of labor radicalism in the 1930s in particular. People like Harry Bridges, you see this great um, uh, riot in 1934, July 5th, 1934. And then we looked at how the military and recreational sailors interacted with the maritime landscape, the seascape, if you will, of California. Most of my research was done on the left here it is the GW Blunt Light. G.W. Blunt White Library at Mystic Seaport. And on the right is the world-class collection of the J. Ford Shaw Library in San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. Um, this is what historians do. They go to archives, they go to collections, they sit there, they put on white gloves, they look at manuscripts that are 200 years old, and then they try to make some inferences from the information that they're digesting. Yeah. So I started by looking at California's geography. And on the left is a sort of a modern representation of California, uh, from San Diego to the Oregon border. California has about one-tenth of the country's coastline. And then it also has a series of rivers and lakes, the Great Bay and San Francisco, of course. But for a long time, it was misunderstood. And on the right is a map from the University of uh, Michigan, the Hennepin Collection, 1519. And this depicts California as an island. 
Uh, so people were ignorant of the geography of California, but even at this very early time period, in their ignorance and in their naivete, they recognized that the sea played a sort of a formative role in California's history. Then I look at the way in which Native Americans interact with the maritime environment. And the top picture on the left, just a little bit of gratuitous nudity, nudity for your uh, <laughs> 3 o'clock viewing pleasure. Um, Native Americans would use what Mother Nature provides. So in the Pacific Northwest, there's redwood forests. Okay, these would be felled by lightning strike. And then you're using whatever tools Mother Nature provides because you're a Stone Age civilization. So you're using a beaver tooth chisel. You're using a deer antler drills. You're using uh, stone axes to create these dugout canoes. In the center of the state, around San Francisco, you've got these tule reeds, these tool marshes. So you just harvest them with a sharp and clam shell. You lay them out to dry. You bundle them up. You've got a raft that you can take onto the uh, San Francisco Bay. You can collect uh, seafood. You can collect waterfowl. You can collect all sorts of different things. In Southern California, they've got plank canoes that are sewn together with animal tendons and sinew. And it's kind of ingenious, really, the way in which indigenous peoples are able to overcome the limitations that Mother Nature has imposed on them to maximize their usage of the marine seascape. And they use it for all the same reasons we use it for. They use it as a trade network. They use it as a communications route. They use it as an immigration platform. They use it as uh, a, a method to uh, invade others. They use it as recreational. So they have canoe races and all sorts of different things. They use it in the same ways they construct the oceans, in the same ways that modern people do. First contact, okay, if you look at the geography of California, and it's a good place to start, it's really hard to sail up the California coast. You've got the winds beating in your face, you've got the uh, current coming down the coast. So generally, um, you're, you're not going to be able to sail up the California coast. The Spanish are in Mexico, they're trying to look for uh, ports when their vessels that are coming from Manila and the Philippines can put in for repairs, for fresh supplies along the trade routes. So they actually make some overland investigations into California. And I think one of the great ironies of maritime history is that San Francisco Bay, which the Spanish described as the harbor of harbors, large enough to house all the ships and all the navies of all the world, is discovered not by a mariner, but by an overland expedition. Because it was fog shrouded, it's kind of naturally camouflaged by these islands that are in San Francisco Bay. Um, there's this long interrupted coastline. And people have been sailing by it for uh, many hundreds of years. And no one really knew that this 1.2 mile entrance, the Golden Gate, existed until it was discovered in 1769. So Spain uh, moves into the area, becomes a contested frontier. Uh, the, the English in particular are looking for it. Francis Drake sends a bunch of uh, voyages to plunder Spanish shipping in the area just north of San Francisco. Uh, the Spanish create a system of missions. There's uh, 21 of them from San Diego to Mission Solano in uh, the wine country uh, with great impact on the Native American communities. And then you've got 1769, 1776, uh, this, this discovery of the port of San Francisco. And you have these Spanish galleons that are you know, large sailing vessels that are flying the oceans in the 15th century. And then I thought of this on the flight home last night. You see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I mean, for laughing. You get it, right? The Ottoman Empire, today we're talking about the, the Ottoman Empire. Yes. All right, so uh, there you go. You're going to use that one, Mark. I am. Uh, some of the, and this, this is in the right hand, lower right hand corner is California Sea Otter, which um, James Cook referred to as the most beautiful object you can place in front of a man other than his wife. So he knew where his bread was buttered. <laughs> One of my colleagues at Cal Maritime, who was a captain on an oil tank, referred to it as nature's oil rag. <laughs> so it kind of just sops up all the oil every time there's a spill in Valdez or someplace like that. But this is what brings a lot of competitors to the region in California. It's these sea otters. Because you can uh, uh, capture them, 
slaughter them, and then use them as trade commodities, particularly with China. Um, so it brings a whole bunch of people into the area, the Russians, the uh, English, um, uh, the Dutch, the French, lots of other people are in this area. Um, a lot of these slides are taken from uh, classroom presentations that I had done two years ago, so I apologize that they don't seem to flow together very well. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the sea otter trade, what you really start to see is these American vessels that will sail around Cape Horn, come into the Pacific, um, get to Hawaii where they're trading some commodities, they're taking on native uh, workers, Kanaka, and then they go to the Pacific Northwest where they're trading with Native Americans for sea otter pelts, and then they go from Pacific Northwest to China, usually stopping at Manila along the way for supplies. So you've got American ships crewed by Pacific Islanders, trading with indigenous peoples in the Pacific Northwest for goods that will be exchanged in the Philippines and China. What you have in the 1740s is essentially globalization. Right? Folks think this is an invention of the 1940s, but I've got you know, pretty compelling evidence that it's a quarter of a millennium earlier. And these are long voyages. You think it's bad being on the Empire State for 45 days. <laughs> Try going on a sailing vessel for three years. Um, not what we're looking for. This is San Francisco in 1847, right before the gold rush. It's known as the habit of Yerba Buena, which means good herb. Um, uh, and if you're looking at this image, it's highly stylized because in the foreground there is a half a dozen or eight ships. And we know by looking at the customs records that in 1847, a total of 11 ships called at San Francisco or Yerba Buena in that year. Um, the following year, after the gold rush, 777 vessels. So you've got this incredible uh, surge of maritime activity. For those of you who know San Francisco at all, this is the original waterfront. That's Montgomery Street. And Montgomery Street is currently where the Transamerica Pyramid is, Transamerica Tower, which is probably a third of a mile from the existing waterfront. So everything between the Transamerica Pyramid and the current waterfront, which is where the baseball stadium is, the ferry terminal, Fisherman's Wharf, is all bay filled. Which means when the big one comes, it will come, what's going to happen to every day between those two landmarks that was decided? It's going gonna, it's gonna to lift the back. It's going, to, it's going to just vaporize. So um, it's something to consider. And I'll, show, I'll talk about how they created all this land. It's a pretty interesting process. Okay, and then you've got this incredible, this is the same vantage point. You've got all these ships here. This is Telegraph Hill. And you've got 777 vessels. So all these ships come in. All the crews go running to the gold field looking for riches. And what happens to the ships? They turn into buildings. They just, they just sit there unoccupied. So the owner of the vessel tries to make a profit off of them. So he turns them into housing. He turns them into saloons. There's one that's turned into a jail. There's another that's turned into a brothel. There's others that are turned into uh, bars and restaurants and anything you can imagine. So you've got this kind of floating city. This, uh, people are coming to San Francisco by clipper ship, by whaling vessel, by just about anything that can float. And you had this first kind of uh, public relations campaign. I, I like these kind of uh, colorful images uh, about uh, the clipper ships that bring people to San Francisco. There was one vessel that I did a lot of research on. It's called the Niantic. It's currently underneath the Transamerica Pyramid. It was a whaling ship that was in Lima, Peru. And word got to them that there was gold in San Francisco. So they, sa they, they sailed, it was a sailing vessel, north. Um, they picked up as many passengers as they possibly could in Central America, charged them an arm and a leg to get to San Francisco, turned the tripods, which used to be, you know, this is where you kept all the oil for the whaling. Uh, they dumped those out and turned them into soup terrines. They caught some uh, turtles along the way, and some sharks, and they used kind of made a bullet base, right, a fish stew, to feed the passengers. And then they got to San Francisco, they ran the ship around, everybody departed from the gold fields, and now that build, that, that ship is part of the foundation of the Transamerica uh, Tower. 
So this is the way they get to San Francisco. This is a, a map from the 1840s, and you know, you leave New York and head down around South America. There's no Panama Canal at this point. It would take you about 200 days uh, under sail. Clipper ship could do it in about 110 if you were lucky. Um, steamers, you could take a steamer to Central America, then walk across with a mule train across, and then take another steamer to San Francisco Pacific Mail Steamship Company. Um, but basically, this was uh, a, a desperate venture. You're not going to do this unless you felt that it was worth it. And if you're an established lawyer, butcher, baker, candlestick maker, you're not going to risk everything to go to San Francisco. So what kind of people are going to San Francisco? People who are attracted to get rich quick schemes, right? Mm -hmm. The uneducated, the uh, young, dumb, uneducated individuals. Okay. And then what you do is you start to, you, you don't go panning for gold. You know, that's kind of a, a fallacy. What you do is if you go panning for gold and you get a couple of flecks in your uh, sieve, what it does is that indicates that there is gold buried beneath the ground. And you could you know, hire an army of Chinese laborers with picks and, and shovels to get to that. Or you could sell that particular location, so they could claim to sell it. And then a big company will come in with the equivalent of uh, a fire hose, okay? blast away all of the topsoil, get to the gold. And now what happens to all of that topsoil? Where does it go? It has to go somewhere. It doesn't go into the atmosphere, right? So where does it go? goes into the rivers the and ultimately into San Francisco Bay. And by one estimate, there's more dirt introduced into San Francisco Bay by hydraulic mining than is taken out of Central America in the creation of the Panama Canal. So imagine digging the Panama Canal and dumping all of that dirt to San Francisco Bay. So what does that do to the ecosystem? First of all, it changes the depth of the bay, right? So what happens when you change the depth of the bay? What happens to all the water that's going out through the Golden Gate? Faster or slower? Much faster. Okay, so you chain, you've introduced hazards to navigation, you've introduced some real uh, changed ecosystem, and then how do you separate the gold from the impurities? What do you use? Chemicals. Chemicals. And what's the what's the chemical in particular? Starts with an M, ends with the mercury. Mercury. For example, the, the newspaper in San Jose. San Jose. Mercury news. Okay? And so what happens when you introduce mercury into this equation? Can you eat fish with mercury? No. Not more than once. <laughs> so, so you've got this environmental catastrophe created by the gold rush. You've got all these people who are coming here. Uh, the first case of in invasive species in world history is uh, the Chilean sand fleet because you have these vessels that come in with sand as ballast, and then they run aground, and then they're introducing these little insects, which are a plague in parts of the Bay Area now. So it has environmental impact. Then you have these vessels that are just abandoned. They're rotting in the bay. So what you do is you create these water lots. You square off an area, put a vessel into it, sink it, take some of Telegraph Hill, Rincon Hill, some of the other areas, wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow, dead horses, dead cats, dead whatever, and you're creating this by little bits and pieces. You're creating the city of San Francisco. Where, where is that from? This is 1855. That's from Shoes Panorama called the Forest of Masts. You house them all, you turn them into warehouses because there's a lack of buildings. This is the forest of masts. These aren't trees you see in the background. Those are the masts of sailing ships. And then here's the original shoreline of San Francisco, kind of undulated, and then the artificially smooth shoreline of San Francisco as it exists today. So everything between this line and the bay is all filled. These ships that have been abandoned, scuttled, and it's a real problem in an area that's subject to seismic activities. So here's San Francisco in 1857. Big difference. And what is everything made out of? Wood. Wood. Lumber. Mm -hmm. So you've got to bring that in from someplace. You've got to bring 
food in from someplace. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. All right? So post gold rush maritime food. You brought everybody here by ship. Now you've got to feed them. Lumber and meat, 800 vessels involved in bay and coasting operations, a lot of exports, don't worry about the data. But what you're seeing is vessels that are designed specifically for the cargoes they're carrying, which is a kind of a new concept as well. Grain and wheat, the Great Central Valley, which runs 200 miles by 40 miles. It's the most productive agricultural region in the United States. This is the weather conditions. You can get two crops into the, into the ground every year. They told they have a drought this year. Can't do it all. Um, fishing and whaling, uh, salmon and cod, the Arctic fields, sugar, fruits, and vegetables. So you want to get fruits and vegetables in from, say, Tahiti or Hawaii. You want to do it before the ship, before the produce um, spoils. So you've got to have a vessel that's fast under sail. So you've got to come up with all of these different, different things to do. Scouts from Alma. It's a museum ship in San Francisco now. And it would transport grain from the Central Valley to San Francisco Bay. And then it's transferred into larger sailing ships. You've got fishing boats in San Francisco Bay. A Faluca here on the left with a stereotypical Latin sail. Chinese junk on the right. So you have these ethnic communities that come up around San Francisco. If you know baseball at all, um, uh, McCovey Cove, it's, it's China based, right? Because that used to be a Chinese community. Um, there's China Camp State Park in San Francisco. Um, again, a Chinese fishing community. And then you've got these fishermen going north to Alaska. Right? And it's the ice choke fields of, 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 um, of the Arctic. Then they go out in these little dories, they go out from the mothership, they go out hand lining for salmon, cod, they bring it back with them, and then they bring it to the mothership for processing. I interviewed one of these fishermen who was still active in the 1930s in this, um, uh, in this activity. And he was in a rowboat, a row dory, and a storm blew up and sent him several miles from the mothership. And he knew that there was no way he was going to survive the night. So he took his canteen of drinking water, poured it over his hands on the oars, froze himself to the oars, okay, so that the oar wouldn't slip out of his hands. And then in the morning, he rowed himself back to the mothership. And he wound up losing three, hand, three fingers on one hand, two on the other, um, to, to frostbite. So the next time you're on the bridge wing of the Empire State, you're complaining that it's a little bit too cold, or you're in the engine room and you're complaining it's a little bit too hot, man up. And think about what these other guys have to go through. Okay. I like this shot because what these guys are doing, they're taking the salmon and chucking them into the, 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 the larger vessel here, and then they're being processed. How'd you like to have this job? You can take a pitchfork and just take a shovel full after shovel full of salmon. And then in the non-PC, uh, environment of the early 20th century, you had much of the work had been performed by Chinese laborers, you know, cutting the heads off the fish, boning them, scaling them, preparing them for sale, and then this was replaced by a machine, and because the machine could do the work of a hundred Chinese immigrants, it was referred to as the iron chink. So, so the, and you see these in uh, museums um, all up and down the west coast. You also have this major uh, attraction to sugar and the Hawaiian Islands. So some companies that are still with us today, like Shreckles or Massin, uh, get their start bringing sugar from the Hawaiian Islands to, to, to California. You get lumber. So here's a, a picture of a, a lumber schooner along the Northern California coast where there are no ports. So what you do is you drop anchor and you stay a little bit off the coast. And then you have to get the lumber from, the, from the, the, the shore to the vessel. And the way you do that is you put it on a slide, okay, which is a, like, a, like, a, like a playground slide. And you just kick the boards down, and somebody here is waiting <coughs> to catch it, and then they stack it on the deck. And if this guy is distracted and is not watching, what, what, what happens? Okay. Just gets the cat <laughs> All right, so you have, uh, it's out of this activity that labor organizations start. Here's another, uh, this is a steam lumber schooner, so all the lumber is piled on the deck. You have shipbuilding activities in the 1890s. Uh, uh, Union Ironworks is still there, it's BAE 
now in South San Francisco. Uh, the Olympia, which is Admiral Dewey's flagship of the Battle of Manila, is built there. In the 1940s, you have ship construction with uh, Henry Kaiser and Mosey the Riveter. So this is a depiction of that activity. <coughs> Extra credit for anybody who can identify the photographer in these photographs. Dorothea Lange. You get it. You got the extra credit. Mm -hmm. Dorothea Lange, who's probably most well known for uh, migrant, motor. migrant motor. Right, so you have these depictions of women during the Great Depression. Uh, the most well known mm -hmm. one is this woman with three children on the road from Oklahoma to California. But she was also hired to take photographs of Rosie the River, and this is in the Richmond shipyards in the 1940s. Um, labor issues in San Francisco. For those of you who've seen Cinderella Man, right? What happens in Newark happens in San Francisco. So folks are hired by the day. We know this is a staged photo now. That everybody was scoped to this ferry building in the morning and essentially beg for work. Okay, and who, who are they going to hire? The ones who are either going to give them a kickback or are certainly not going to complain to the authorities about unfair um, uh, labor practices. Who are not going to be. Uh, concerned about anything, but that changes. You got guys like Harry Bridges, who starts to organize laborers in the Great Depression, a little bit earlier actually. You have these great images of what was the date of that last one? 38, early 1838. Oh, almost today, huh? Maybe 1838. You have Maynard Dixon, who's a pretty famous pen and ink artist of the Great Depression, funded through WPA. Monies. And here you have this individual who's exhorting his fellow workers to strike under the watchful eyes of San Francisco Police Department officials. You've got these guys doling out street justice uh, because if you're a, a long uh, you know, if a faculty member goes on strike at a university, they're very hard to replace. Nobody has the skills that these individuals possess. If you're a long and you go on strike. What skills are you taking with you? <coughs> you're, you're a big, strong guy. That's, that's why you're a longshoreman. Okay? And who can replace big, strong guys? Another big, strong guy. Another big, strong guy. Okay? So what, how can the big, strong guys protect their invest, protect their jobs? They make gangs and they... The way big, strong guys do it is with violence. And this is a, a depiction of three striking longshoremen who are beating the hell out of a scab, somebody would cross the picket lines. And um, what they would use, with their typical uh, vengeful justice was after knocking somebody out, lay them across a curb, and then jump on their arms and break their arms so that they can't lift, they can't lift any cargo anymore. <coughs> now this is uh, the turning point in American maritime labor history. It's Bloody Thursday, July 5th. These two individuals, Nicholas Bordois and Harold Sperry, were striking longshoremen and supporters of striking longshoremen. And they had been a running gun battle with police during essentially July 3rd. Independence Day, July 4th, the port is closed. July 5th, they come back to work. And you have this episode where two individuals are shot in the back and die. Um, and it becomes this galvanizing movement. Because up until that point, uh, labor was seen as um, very greedy bunch. They, they were not well respected in American history until this happens. And it's hard to argue against two guys who were shot in the back by the police. Coming to a, a conclusion now, we've got naval activities. Okay. You've got uh, Mare Island, which is the first shipyard on the west coast. Uh, just a stone's throw from where Cal Maritime is currently located. Uh, Admiral Farragut of Battle of New Orleans, Spain is the first superintendent. And it creates a large number of vessels. The first steam vessel of uh, modern Navy is the Saginaw. I apologize for the spelling there. And then they create a long line of ships, uh, including very many nuclear submarines. This is the Mariano G. Vallejo, named for the uh, founder of the city in which uh, Cal Maritime is located. And I'll conclude with this sort of uh, image of San Francisco maritime history. And I like it for a lot of reasons. One is just, uh, I think, a really cool photograph. Um, second, you know, you've got this fellow walking along Ocean Beach, 
and they're, these, these are records, right? They're, they're trying to take whatever is salvageable from the vessel and reuse it. Uh, there's actually a big industry in San Francisco. And what I really like about it is you can see there's somebody in the yard arm, somebody way up top. So I just think it's a kind of a very stark image that although San Francisco has this rich maritime history, and California has this tremendously rich maritime history, it's also a very, uh, uh, it's a history that's marked by death and by danger. Uh, within California waters, there are over 2,800 recorded shipwrecks. Uh, there are a large number of shipwrecks in San Francisco Bay itself, uh, some which occur with staggering loss of life, several hundred people, for example, um, uh, in, in the Brother Jonathan. So you've got this um, incredible, I think, dichotomy that San Francisco in itself and California in, in, in general makes its living off of the sea in all of the ways that I've just described. And yet the sea is such a um, transformative <coughs> power in California for both good and evil that you have to kind of weigh the risks and the rewards. So um, with that, I'll open the floor to questions, either about this presentation or the process or anything else that floats your boat, if I'm intended. Um, thanks for letting me uh, speak about something that I spent a lot of time on. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation.